His truth is marching on. Let's pray. Lord God, we pray that your truth would march on. We pray that you would help us to preach. In Jesus' name, who is the truth and is a double-edged sword, amen. Last week we began preaching on uh, Revelation chapter 14. And you know, in Revelation chapter 13, the beast, we, John sees the beast just making a mess of things on the earth. And then in chapter 14, verse 1, his eyes see the glory of the coming of the Lord. The Lord comes many times in the Revelation, and yet it's all one time. It's the point at which eternity touches time. I think that's now. Now is the judgment, said Jesus. And incidentally, now is the only way to dance. You have to be in the now to dance. You can't be thinking about your footsteps in the past and your footsteps in the future. You dance now. Well, John sees the glory of the coming of the Lord and the 144,000 with him. They all move in perfect harmony with Jesus as they sing the new and eternal song, the gospel. John sees Jesus and his dancing body. Last time, we noted that learning to dance is less about seizing control and more about learning to surrender control. You have to lose yourself in the music in order to find yourself dancing. Remember? The harder Nevin tried to dance, the more self-conscious he got and the worse he was at dancing. Until one day, he stopped thinking about dancing and he just listened to the music. So it's not that Nevin didn't try to dance, it's just that all of his efforts were no longer labor. They were more like rest. Uh, they were no longer constrained, but, but free. It's like the rhythm of the dance was incarnate in Nevin's body. Nevin couldn't comprehend the logic in the song, but the logic in the song comprehended Nevin and set his feet to dancing. The sermon was titled, Blessed Are the Dead Who Die and Dance. We ended at verse 13, which reads like this. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, write this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Blessed are the dead who die. Not who have died or, or will die, but blessed are the dead who die. Blessed are the dead who who die. Blessed are the dead who... We talked about the fact that Jesus, John, Paul, and most of Scripture really um, talks as if physical death really isn't death. But separation from life is death. So, so this is, is death. Death is not the result of sin. Sin is choosing death. Uh, the blue dot represents uh, a soul, and that one on the right is lost and uh, alone. The Lord said, the day you eat of it, you will die, or, or more specifically, dying, you will die. This is, this is more death. They built a city and hoped it was life. These souls may pretend to love, but they can no longer comprehend love. They've wrapped themselves in something other than, than love. This is the death of death, which John calls the second death. And the death of death is the life. Life is the great dance of love. God is love. God is three persons and one dance. God is love and he's calling you to come join him. You, you, you don't have to physically die to do that, but you do have to die. You know, it's not clear whether the dancers on Mount Zion have physically 
died or not, but they were dead. And they have died because they are redeemed. Blessed are the dead who die and dance. Last week after the service, Bao asked me this great question. He said, Peter, how do you die? You see, it's not as easy as you would think once you realize that the true death is not the death of the body, but the death of the soul. That's why suicide doesn't work. It just doesn't work. You can't kill the self with more self. That's just self, more self. Can't kill the self with, with the self. Uh, but but Bao, I, Bao wasn't asking about suicide. Uh, Bao, I think, I think I know what Bao was asking about. He was asking the question that I ask myself all the time. How, how do you stop thinking about the dance steps and just start dancing? How do you lose yourself and find yourself dancing? How do you forget yourself? Gah! Have you ever tried to forget something? The harder you try to forget, the more you remember. Peter, you're, you're preaching. Stop thinking about the dance steps. Peter, stop thinking about the fact that some people think your sermons are too long and too confusing. Peter, stop thinking uh, that, that you're, the fact that you, th you're, well, sometimes, Peter, stop thinking about the fact that you really struggle sometimes to find your words and maybe you're kind of washed up and, and you, you, you want to be as funny as Alan, but you're not. Stop thinking about you. What's wrong with you? Would you stop thinking? How, why won't you forget yourself? Why can't you stop? How do you forget you? How do you go to a party and stop worrying about yourself long enough to really enjoy another self? And in the process, enjoy your own self. How do you lose yourself and then find yourself loving, living, and dancing? Well, if you're English, this is one way. Isn't that something? A whole bunch of boring, uptight, socially repressed British people, <laughs> and suddenly they break out dancing. And in a few minutes, they're all singing the same song, dancing in harmony to the same tune. None of them are worried about looking silly or stupid. None of them are worried about being judged. Why? Because they just received the judgment. England wins! Which means we win! I'm dancing! That's the power of the gospel. Gospel means good news. Unfortunately, none of those people are dancing today. For England lost to Croatia in the semifinals, and, and even if they hadn't lost in the semifinals, the, the dance would have gotten old, and right now they'd be worried about the final game that's happening even now in this moment as we speak. But imagine if there was like an eternal good news, an eternal gospel. I mean, good news, uh, news of the victory that touched and transformed every moment in space and time and never got old, for things never get old in eternity. In the seventh day, everything is new. Every moment in space and time is filled with what? The logos, the logos of life, the rhythm of the dance. Jesus wins everywhere, every when, and every how. Well, to lose yourself, you have to become preoccupied with something bigger, better, or more beautiful than yourself. As we said last time, it was beauty killed the beast. Nevin had his self humbled by circumstances and his inability to dance. And then he heard beautiful music and lost himself in the music and then found himself dancing. He was humbled and then exalted by a song. So how, how do you die? Well, you have to look or listen to something bigger, better, or more beautiful than yourself if you really want to die. You look to God. 
In Scripture, no one can truly see God and live. And that's how you die. So why are we so afraid to die? Isn't it because we're terrified of judgment? We think it's best just to be a wallflower, <laughs> not get carried away by the song and make a fool of myself. We think I better maintain control because I, I might be judged. In fact, I better get to work on myself in order to prepare for judgment. I better judge myself, save myself, redeem myself. I, I, better, I better just get to work. And, and so you do, and you know how it is. You work and you work and you work, but you can't rest because all your labor seems to keep well, just turning to dust and, and blowing away. And, and yet you know you'll be judged, and, and you're not prepared for the judgment. So you think, I better hide myself until I am. And yet you're fast becoming, I am not, nothing but a shadow, alone, in the dark, a ghost. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. I suspect that also means woe to the dead who won't die. My wife and I have had some pretty weird, bizarre encounters with ghosts. The Old Testament refers to them as the Raphaim, or familiar spirits, or Ob. The New Testament uses the word phantasma. I think they are the dead who won't die. I have a slew of weird stories we don't have t time for, but suffice it to, for now right, to, to say I think that ghosts are souls that are convinced they must justify themselves before the judgment. And so they're dead, but terrified to die, and so they're stuck. Stuck in space and time in a place called Hades or Sheol, no one can truly see God and live. Or maybe stay dead. When you truly see him, you'll lose your psyche and find it. Scripture man commands us never to consult with the dead, the necros. That's necromancy. And yet I, I've preached to the dead on at least three or four occasions of which I'm very much uh, aware. My wife, you know, is a church cleaning lady, and her old building that we rented down the street was built in 1890 on a graveyard. One day she came and got me because she kept hearing weeping through this little door in the closet where we kept all the musical instruments down toward the basement of the church. Together we went down to this dark space that was right under the sanctuary where she saw figures just huddled in the darkness like, like this. I'd already bound evil spirits and told them to leave, so I, I began telling these figures who Jesus was. My wife, whom I've learned to trust in these things over the years, she saw Jesus appear. He, he appeared in the darkness with a door, a door open behind him. And so I preached gospel to the ghosts. He loves you. He forgive. All is forgiven. He loves you. You can go home. Susan said, Peter, some of them are looking up. And the moment they look up and see Jesus, it's like they're suddenly transformed. They stand up and they go to them, and, and Jesus takes them through the door, and on the other side of the door is sunlight, and like an entire new creation. And then she said, but Peter, some of them won't look up. She then heard Jesus say, I'm leaving this door here for those that will still come. On Sunday mornings, I used to think of them when I'd preach, for that room was directly under the spot on which I would be standing. Why wouldn't they listen? Why wouldn't they look up? They're terrified of judgment. 
They were convinced they had to justify themselves before they could be judged. They didn't realize that the grim reaper is not grim. They didn't know that the judgment is a harvest. And in Scripture, a harvest isn't grim. And God always commands a party at, at the harvest. In Scripture, there are at least there are three harvests every year, and every one of them is a commanded party, a feast, a festival, a holy day. That means holiday, holiday. It's holiday time. Passover comes at the barley harvest. It's the first in early spring. Jesus is the Passover lamb, firstborn of all creation, firstborn from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. He is the first fruits of them that have fallen asleep. Pentecost comes seven weeks after uh, Passover. It's the wheat harvest, also called the feast of first fruits. 144,000 uh, of the church are a kind of first, first fruits. The Feast of Ingathering, or Tabernacle, comes at the grape harvest when all the fruit of the field is gathered in and the wine press is, is trampled. Now you should be familiar with that clip because I've used it like 300 times. In, <laughs> they're harvesting grapes and dancing in the wine press, bride and groom. That might be painful if you're a grape, but that was not grim. That definitely was not grim. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. That's Revelation 14, verse 1. John sees the Lamb on Mount Zion, the 144,000 singing warrior brides, dancing in perfect harmony. Verse 6, an angel flies overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to all peoples. The angel says, fear God and give him glory, for the hour of his judgment has come. Verse 13, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed, blessed means not grim. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors for their deeds Follow them. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud, one like a son of man, with a golden crown on his head, and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in the sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. So John sees Jesus, our Passover. And then in verses 16, 14 through 16, John sees Pentecost, the harvest of the wheat. Next, in 17 through 20, John will see the Feast of Tabernacles, the grape harvest. The, that feast lasted seven days and ended with an eighth day that was considered to be like an eternal seventh day in which all is finished and everything is good. Well, here in verse 14, John looks and sees the reaper. He has a golden crown on his head, and he is one like a son of man. Hmm. According to Scripture, the devil had the power of death, but, but what is the power of death? Read it in Hebrews. It's the fear of death. And the death of death is the life. <laughs> and Jesus is the life. He's the resurrection and the life. Jesus is the angel of Yahweh, and Jesus is the reaper. He said, I will come for you. Jesus is the reaper. Another angel calls to Jesus from the heavenly temple, which is us. Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus, for the harvest is ripe. I think that must be like the Holy Spirit in us, or coming out of us, or through us, or something. In Matthew, Jesus says this, the harvest is at the close of the age. In Mark, he says, when the grain is, when the grain is ripe, at once, at once, the reaper puts in uh, this, why aren't you, maybe, maybe you're not ripe. Anyway, when the grain is ripe, at once, the reaper puts in the sickle. And John, he says, look, the fields are white unto harvest. They're ripe. Now, this is fascinating in several ways, because that means that the judgment happened 2,000 years ago. And it means that maybe the judgment is like right now. 
Secondly, it means that something rather strange is being harvested, because think of what Jesus was looking at in John 4, a crowd of sinners. A crowd of sinners that would, like, take his life, take his life, betray his life, chant crucify, 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 as he's offered up on, on, a, on a tree. John 12, Jesus says this, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now is the judgment of this world. And Jesus is the promised seed. And Scripture says that we are God's field. It makes Jesus the thing that is reaped and also the reaper. If it dies, it bears much fruit, says Jesus, the Passover lamb. And when he died, he delivered up his spirit, the same spirit that fell on the church at Pentecost, when they all began to share everything in common with glad and generous hearts, as if their lives were some sort of dance of endless love. According to Paul, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, or humility, and self-control. You know, if love is a law, you better love. I end up hating love because I cannot fulfill the law. But love is not a law. God is love. And he fulfills me and sets my feet to dancing. The dance is joy. When I fake joy, I make everyone sick. And if I think I'll be judged on my ability to have peace, I get really neurotic. I mean, stressed out. If I think I have to manufacture fruit to justify myself before the judgment, you know what I do? I compete for kindness. And I become the worst sort of unkind, a Pharisee. I take the good and crucify goodness. I manufacture faith, which is faith in my own faith, which is just the opposite of faith. You know, if I have faith in my wife, Susan, it's not to my glory, it's to her glory. She's the farmer, I'm, I'm the field. She grew faith in me through years of faithfulness to me. It's to her glory, not mine. If I think I'm responsible for humility, I become too proud to dance. You know, humility is not being ashamed of yourself and hating yourself. Just as humility is not exalting yourself, humility is forgetting yourself. Jesus said, when you do good deeds, don't even let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. The only way that I can be totally unaware of what my body is doing and yet still be doing something logical, beautiful, and good is if I'm dancing. It is if I've lost myself and found myself dancing. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, humility, and self-control, which means self-under-control, in gratia. It's, it's like a body no longer controlled by its own logic, but controlled by the logos of God, the rhythm of the new and eternal song. Well, well good deeds are the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit. There's never been a scientist that was able to manufacture fruit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Bad deeds are the... <clears throat> work of the flesh. When I think I can manufacture the fruit of the Spirit, I make fake fruit. I make works of the flesh, and then I advertise them as the fruit of the Spirit. I make envy. I can make envy, and then I pretend it's love. I make pride and pretend it's faith. I make factions, and I pretend that that's peace and, and unity. I make fake fruit, imitation fruit. In Greek, anti-fruit, like antichrist. That doesn't just mean opposed to Christ. It means an imitation. I make an imitation Christ. A lie about Jesus. Jesus told about a, a parable about a, a farmer that sowed seed in his field. And then an enemy that sowed tares. Uh, wheat, or uh, tares is like imitation wheat, so tares in the same field. Tares look like wheat, and yet they're an entirely different species. They are imitation wheat or anti-wheat. Jesus said the enemy is the devil, and in John he tells us that the devil is the father of lies. 
and that the Pharisees were of their father, the devil. Well, the devil cannot father people. He's not capable of that. But he does sow lies. And those that believe the lies can manufacture imitation people, proud people, false people. We can't just go around pulling up the tares without also rooting up the wheat, according to Jesus. We can't judge because the roots are entangled and they look kind of the same. We can't judge others and we can't even judge ourselves for each of us is like a field, a field of good choices and bad choices, a field of good deeds and bad deeds. Jesus said you can't pull up the tares. You have to wait till the harvest. You see, it'd be good news if the harvest would now, was now because it would mean that the farmer would free me. The farmer could free you of your weeds even now and maybe in that broken, dirty soil he would plant more seed. John the Baptist said that the Christ will gather the wheat into barns and burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. After the wheat is separated from the tares, the weeds, it's threshed to separate the chaff from the grain. Some people think that other people, some other people are chaff, and then another group of people is, is, is wheat, the grain. But, but every grain of wheat grows within a casing that is chaff. In the same way, Scripture claims that there is a, a new man growing in the casing of your old man, a, a new self growing in your false Self. That, that new man is born of God and the old man is the work of the flesh or is the flesh. The new man gives glory to God and the old man receives glory from men and gives glory to itself. So if you're proud of yourself, that self is chaff. But if you're grateful for yourself, oh God, thank you for me. If you're grateful for yourself, that self is wheat. If you're proud, if you exalt yourself, and so you're ashamed or, or arrogant all, all the time thinking about yourself, you've confused yourself with the chaff. And you will be tormented by the fire. So if God would separate you from the chaff before the fire, that would really be good news. Chaff is restlessness, bondage, and it makes you into a terrible dancer, and yet... And yet, God does grow a kernel of wheat within the confines of that chaff. So anyway, thank God for good deeds in you because they are the deeds of God in you. But should you thank God for the chaff and the tares? And why did God ever allow bad deeds? Surely you've asked that question. Why, God, why do you ever allow these bad deeds and bad people? Why did you ever allow bad people in the first place? Many commentators seem to think that Revelation 14, 14 through 16, the harvest of the wheat, wheat is the harvest of good deeds. And then Revelation 14, 18 through 20 is the harvest of bad deeds. For the angel harvests grapes. And those grapes are thrown into the wine press of the fury or passion of the wrath of God. Verse 17, then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire. And he called with a loud voice to one who had the sharp sickle, put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1,000 600 stadia. It says another angel came out of the temple. So maybe that's, that's not Jesus. But it could be Jesus because angel means messenger. And uh, another angel came from the altar and, and called to the, the altar where they make sacrifice and called to the first. This may still be a picture of Jesus and his spirit, but, but if it's not, where's Jesus now? Well, in chapter 
19, verse 15, we read that Jesus treads, present tense, even though translators change it to a future tense, it's present tense. Jesus treads the winepress of the thumos, of the, of the passion of the wrath of God. That's where you'll find him, bride of Christ, in the winepress. The Lord says, vengeance is mine. And we all want vengeance, if we're honest. Um, the word is ekdikesis in Greek. It literally means outright or bring out righteousness. As if righteousness was stuck in something. Around 800 BC, Joel prophesied that someone would tread the winepress filled with the enemies of evil, or filled with the enemies of Israel who, who were evil, filled with evil. If you're like an oppressed people group, that's, that's pretty good news. Around 500 B.C., Isaiah prophesied the same thing. Chapter 63, 1 through 10. He sees a great warrior covered in garments stained with cr crimson red like blood. He comes from trampling the wine press. At first, we think Isaiah is prophesying that the Lord will trample Israel's enemies and, and in that way save Israel. And he is. But as we read, we begin to wonder if maybe Israel is that enemy. Verse 10, we read that the Lord became the enemy of Israel. Verse 6, the Lord says, I trampled down the peoples. Dang, that might include his peoples. Verse 5, the Lord says, So my own arm saved me and brought me salvation. Why would God need salvation? Why would God save God? You know, if my children need to be saved, I also need to be saved. You know, if my children have an enemy, I also have an enemy. Even if that enemy is me <laughs> or them. I mean, because usually we're our own worst enemy, right? Verse 4, I have trodden the winepress alone, says the Lord. And from the people, uh, none was there to help me. My own arm brought me salvation, says God the Father, and then I have trodden the winepress alone, says the strong arm of the Lord, and from the peoples no one was there to help me. Verse 1, the watchman sees this warrior coming from Edom. Now Edom is another name for Esau. Esau was the firstborn, and Jacob cheated Esau out of his birthright. Jacob is another name for Israel, and Israel is another name for us, and Jesus is the firstborn. <laughs> Chew on that one for a while. But anyway, like I was saying, we all want vengeance on our enemies, and that it might happen really is good news. It's good news. We want vengeance upon those who are evil, but as we grow, we realize that we too are those that are evil. We gain knowledge of good and evil, and in the words of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, we come to realize that the line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart and through all human hearts. I love the Battle Hymn of the Republic because it's not really about the Republic. 1861, Julia Howe, she heard some soldiers singing this battle song at a presentation, and a pastor friend of hers said to her, she said, Julia, you could write better lyrics to that song, and so she did. And so the soldiers began singing a new song, I Think It's Eternal. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. Revelation 19, we read that he treads the winepress and that he wields a sword. It comes from his mouth and he uses it to smite the nations the peoples. In verse 18, we find that the sword severs the flesh from all men. 
Dang, not some men, all men. In Scripture, grape juice is called the blood of the grape. It gets pressed from the flesh of the grape. And it appears that all flesh is in the wine press of the passion of the wrath of God. In Romans, Paul writes about sin in the flesh. He talks as if sin in the flesh is like juice in a grape or blood in your body. And at the wine press, Christ crushes it. That's God's vengeance. But this is a crazy thing. A wine press makes wine. It's blood that is wine and wine that is blood. Who ever heard of such a, such a crazy thing? And the reapers, the reapers are not grim. And the one who treads the wine press is named God is salvation. The wine press is trodden outside the city. That's where the flesh of the sin offering was to be burned. And that's where our Lord's flesh was crushed on a tree. Isaiah 53. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity, the sin of us all. It was the will of the Lord to crush him when his soul, his psyche, makes an offering for sin. So, so, so Jesus tramples, and Jesus is the one that's trampled. Romans 8, 3. God sent his son in the likeness of sin, full flesh, and for sin to condemn sin in the flesh. How did Jesus get his flesh full of sin when he never sinned? 2 Corinthians 5, For our sake God made him to be sin who knew no sin. God made him to be sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. In the wine press, God transforms, somehow he transforms our sin into his righteousness. And this must be the vengeance of God, how he brings out the righteousness, life that we've kept to ourselves uh, becomes somehow life for others, and that's righteousness. On the cross, God in Christ Jesus transforms our sin into righteousness. On a tree in a garden, just outside the walls of Jerusalem, our bridegroom is crushed, and we gain the knowledge of good and receive life and begin to bleed life for others. The life is in the blood. The blood is wine, and the wine is blood. What else could the winepress of the passion of the wrath of God be other than the cross? And yet I never hear anyone talk about it. But the church fathers talked about it. Gregory the Great, Augustine of Hippo, and it's been represented in art down through the ages. This is a painting from 1490. Uh, this is a picture from a Calvinist in 1596. This is from Germany in 1649. I don't know if you can see it, but there are two naked folks down there on the left. See them? That's Adam and Eve. See, they were no strangers to this press and to this cross, to this tree. And so what are the grapes of wrath? <laughs> I think these are the grapes of wrath. And now if you've been tracking with these sermons all of this time, hopefully you'll think to yourself, hey, that's a blue bubble. <laughs> My soul is a blue bubble. My psyche is a blue bubble. Exactly. You have to lose your psyche to find it and start dancing. But didn't God create my soul when he breathed the breath of life into the dust? Yes, exactly. Your life is God's life. And Christ is that life. He is the life in your soul. If you refuse to surrender the life, if you hold the breath as if it were your own life, you'll... <sighs> you'll puff up and turn blue. If you refuse to expire just as you were inspired, you're dead and will remain alone. Adam didn't know that it was not good to be alone. Didn't know that. So in the garden, God planted a tree. And on the tree was life. And on the tree was the knowledge of the good. For 
The good is the life. Uh, God is good and Christ is the life. We took the good to make ourselves good, which is evil, which means we took the life, which is death. We took the life, which is death, but Christ revealed that God has always given the life, which is the good. And so at the cross we gain knowledge of the good, which is giving your life, and so we surrender our lives, for Christ has given his life uh, to us, and we give our lives back to, the, to the, the Father. We surrender our lives, which are actually dead, but the death of death is eternal life. And what is eternal life? It's an endless communion of life that circulates through the body of Christ. It's a river of life coursing through vessels of mercy that were once upon a time vessels of wrath. So what is a grape of wrath? It's you. Separated from God. Holding your breath. Hanging on to your own life. And with what is God so angry? He's angry at the separation. Which is death. And what is his desire? The death of death. Which is life. A communion of, of love. And what is his solution? He tramples the winepress and he is also the one that is trampled. He is absolute mercy. It's how he saves himself from the pain of being separated from you. And it's how he creates in you a new desire. The desire for life. And he is life. A desire such that you would know the good and choose the good in freedom. Such that you would no longer be a vessel of wrath, but a vessel of mercy. Such that you would bleed love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faith, and self-control. You would bleed it. You wouldn't hang on to it as if it was your own. You'd grow fruit and rejoice at every opportunity to give it away. Such that you would join the great dance. Such that you would love as you have been loved. Such that you would be made in the very image of God. You see, the judgment of God not only separates good deeds from bad, it takes your bad deeds and transforms them into God's good deed, which is you, the new you. That's how God makes a St. Peter, a St. Paul, or St. John. You know that, right? He lets them sin, and then he reveals his mercy. And Peter the coward becomes Peter the rock on which Jesus builds his church. And Paul, the chief, he said chief, that means first, the foremost of sinners. Paul, the foremost of sinners, becomes the apostle of grace. And John, the son of thunder, because he had so much anger, John, the son of thunder, becomes the apostle of love. The judgment of God reveals that all your good deeds are God's deeds, and it transforms all your bad deeds into mercy. So the judgment of God really is the death of your ego, and the judgment of God is the only, it's the only way to die, the only way to fly, the only way to die. And the judgment of God well, is the death of death. It's the death of death that sets your feet to dancing. People, people don't dance, I think. They don't dance because they're afraid of judgment. But God's judgment will make you dance. You cannot justify yourself before the judgment of God, but the judgment of God justifies you. You can't comprehend the judgment of God, but the judgment of God will comprehend you. The judgment of God is the great dance. The judgment of God is beauty. It's beauty that kills the beast and transforms the harlot into the bride. The judgment of God can look painful in this world, but it is the very ecstasy of the next world. When one person loves in this fallen world, it looks like that, a man hanging on the cross. When two people love, it looks like a great marriage and maybe even a honeymoon. When everybody loves, oh, that's a party. It's a great party. It's a, it's a dance. It looks like a living, dancing, blessed body, the body of Christ. The judgment of God is the harvest of the earth. And have you noticed what it is that's being harvested? Wheat and grapes. That's bread and wine. <laughs> That's body and blood, the body of Christ. 
humanity in the image of God. When and where everything is good and it is finished. You know, the judgment of God is everything that you truly desire. The judgment of God is the eternal gospel. The judgment of God is Jesus. And why am I telling you this? Why am I telling me this? Why do I preach to the dead? So we'd look up and see the judgment and maybe even begin to start dancing. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. So would you close your eyes? Just close your eyes. Right now, you sit before the judgment seat of the living God. Just pray this prayer with me. Pray it in the sanctuary of your heart. Lord God, I am your field, and I am your vineyard. You are the Lord of the harvest. So judge me, Jesus. I'm your field. And I can't seem to separate the wheat from the tares. I try, but I can't. So I'm just giving you the field. Thank you for the good that you have grown in me. Thank you for the wheat. And I surrender the tares, all the ways I pretended to be good when I'm not. Lord, I really don't know what is, what is wheat and what is a tear, but, but you do. And it's your field. And I surrender the chaff. Lord, maybe some of these things were necessary in the past, but I don't need them anymore. Thank you for the grain that you grew in the chaff. It's yours. It's all yours. I'm your field. And I'm your vineyard. You are the vine. I am the branches. You supply me with life, life that is your very self. You are the life, but I have considered my life to be my own. Uh, that's sin. Take it to your wine press and turn it into grace. Oh, thank you, my God, that where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. It's yours. Judge me, Jesus. I think this is my point. It's not my harvest. I am your harvest. And so he took bread and broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. Take and eat. And in the same manner, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. 
Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. This is his judgment seat. And I think he's saying something like this to you. Come die with me and come rise with me and let's enjoy our harvest. You know, we can start dancing even in the wine press. That's good news. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know if any of the dead are listening right now. I don't know if the Raphaim, the Phantasmas, or the Obes are still cowering in the dark down in the basement of the old church building. But if they are, I'm, I'm pretty well convinced of this. It's true. Jesus is with them. Because I'm a dad, and I'm not a great dad, but if one of my kids is lost, I'm going to be lost with them. So I think he's there by the power of his spirit, whispering, you can open your eyes. Isaiah prophesied that the earth would give birth to the Raphaim, the dead. And we'll read in a few chapters that uh, in the end, that place will be thrown into a lake of holy fire and death will be no more. But this is my point this morning. You don't need to fear death. Because if you came to this table, <laughs> you just died. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. See, if you believe it, Sometimes you just, you'll start dancing. But, you only kind of believe. He's still growing belief in you. Remember, faith is a fruit of his spirit. And so every day, uh, uh, let, let your feet be jubilant and bring you back to the judgment seat and sit before him and, and remember, um, I am not the Lord of the harvest. <laughs> I'd remember that this morning because last night I felt like it didn't go very well. So I just had to sit before the Lord and I felt like he, I finally got it. Peter, Peter, it's not your harvest. <laughs> Peter, um, you are my harvest. <laughs> well, that's gospel because he's a good farmer. He's a good reaper. He's a good bread break, baker. And he's an incredible winemaker. So in Jesus' name, believe the gospel.